for allowing this unusual uh, presentation today, which is written in the form of two conversations, which I will read to together with my colleagues, Caroline and Diana. So, the first is uh, Act One, at the dinner table, after collective cooking with two friends. And this is a picture, actually it's a previous one. You have a wrong picture. Rachel? Oh, yes. This one? Okay. Does it work? Check, one, two. Check. Hey. Yes? Okay. So the first act is titled At the Dinner Table After Collective Cooking with Two Friends. And we should go to the previous one. <laughs> um, so here we see a picture some people will recognize themselves. It's from a class that was held at my house in my kitchen with students. And we did an exercise of collective cooking together with the students of design studies. So, um, so how do you think the food turned out? The rice was a bit watery in my opinion, but I, I really loved uh, how the Chinese vegetables tasted uh, with the spices. We rarely eat these types of vegetables in the Middle East, so the texture was a bit strange for me, but quite tasty. What I liked the most were the colors, the light yellow of the saffron rice together with the green of the shiso leaf and the red of the plum looked really beautiful together. So would you all agree that this was a process of collective design? Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, do you mean to imply that cooking is design? Um, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I'm not sure I agree with you. Uh, Claudius' thesis argument about makeup and cooking being considered as design was quite convincing to me. When she sets the task for herself to make a vegan flan, she definitely has to act as a designer. Number one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and how is it that her making of a flan was designed in your view? Uh, because her challenge was to create a vegan flan without eggs and milk, which otherwise would glue the flan together and still make it taste and look like a traditional flan. It had to be solid, it had to have a certain conical shape. Even though the materials she used were natural, the process was the same as for creating something artificial. Like in design, the final product was man-made, well, woman-made in her case, and even more so, the process was analogical to design. She had to iterate several times. She tried, she failed, she failed well, and finally, she managed to arrive at something quite satisfactory. Isn't this exactly the process of design? But isn't design, by definition, a product of mass production that has surplus value embedded in it? Or in its best, wouldn't it have to be framed as a process of emancipation from the capitalist framework? Hmm, I'm not so sure. In fact, I feel more and more interested to search for design beyond systems of exchange value. Hmm, I, I wonder whether you, uh, what you have in mind is more considered craft than, than design. Hmm, design might not be the best word, it is true. That is why Victor Papanek talks about design with small d. I like this minor alteration because it doesn't confine design to a commodity and yet it keeps the conversation within the discourse of design, which is very important to maintain. And that is why we're sitting at the same table, I guess. I thought that we were sitting at the same table because you invited us to cook and eat together, not to give us a lecture. <laughs> uh, do you think that this conversation would have any use to designers? Um, I doubt that uh, they would even care about whether cooking is design. Um, you're right. Uh, I don't think that most designers would or should care about cooking, uh, but are designers the only participants in the design discourse? I guess not, but uh, who would care about this analogy you're trying to make? Well, there are many people who care about design without being designers or even design theorists. For instance, I came upon the work of Lambrus Malafouris, an archaeologist who has recently turned to the field of cognitive science. He is saying that material engagement, which happens through the hand rather than inside the brain, is a way of both knowing and shaping the world. He's mainly using the term material engagement, but sometimes he also uses the term design. And what does this have to do with cooking? Mm. It was fascinating for me to read how Malafouris sees objects and processes that we conventionally associate with design as extensions of the human mind. For Malafouris, the mind is not just in the head, but in the things we make. 
He often refers to the famous example of the blind man with a stick by Merleau-Ponty. The stick is the extension of the blind person's mind, his way of knowing the world. Malafouris doesn't differentiate between making and using things, as we humans make things in order to allow ourselves to further shape the world. But wouldn't it be too generic to claim that all our acts, uh, true and wit things, are designed? Malafouris' main example of material engagement is the work with clay. In pottery making, thinking doesn't happen separately, but rather emerges through the handwork during the engagement with clay and clay has as much agency as the human. I'm sure you would agree that the process of the clay pot making is not very different from the making of food. So we can consider food making, if not design, at least as an act of material engagement. But can you please remind us why we need to prove that cooking is design? Well, for the paper I'm writing, uh, I need to prove that elemental acts of material engagement are actually acts of design that help us reshape the world. I need this in order to move further to my argument that such kinds of actions are instrumental in autonomous movements and that everyday people who participate in projects of material engagement, such as collaborative kitchens in movements like Occupy, are in fact acting as designers in producing a change. Because for a change of this kind, the technical or the artificial is always entangled with the social. The two act together. Designerly action is, for me, the modus operandi of autonomous movements. I think you lost me here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you understand that you're creating an extra problem for yourself. Because by choosing cooking as your elemental example of design, you put yourself in a situation that you also need to prove that cooking is design. Mm -hmm. You could use another example. Mm. You're right. But actually, I do this not only in order to show that this is a valid analogy for design, but also to show that cooking brings with it some qualities that will help our conversation about design in ways that a typical design example would not. And what should those be? I feel that some of it would be the embodied aspect of cooking, what we could perhaps call design sensing. And this is in fact the opposite of design thinking, but let's not go there now. Uh, this idea of embodiment, to my mind, resonates with the current discourse on repair that emphasizes sensual knowledge, while at the same time, and most importantly, this path would connect with the discourse on care, caring for the other, but also self-preservation as an act of political warfare, to quote the activist writer Audre Lorde. Um, it is true that these aspects are not coming very clearly across in design, especially when you see design as a commodity. I definitely want to go beyond commodification to what Gibson and Graham call the non-capitalocentric realm. I feel that seeing monetary exchange in all social relations is not sufficient for our present discourse. Think of what happens under conditions of financial and material scarcity, for instance, in Latin America or in the European South, where I come from. Every time I go to Athens, I'm amazed by the proliferation of solidarity movements, most of them rooted on ideas of political autonomy beyond the state. Hmm. So would you go as far as claiming that material engagement is the way that a social movement should go to achieve change? Um, what I try is to provide my own designerly definition of autonomous politics as a redirective practice of materiality. I think that by paying attention to the collective material engagement that we see in solidarity movements, we enrich both the political discourse and our understanding of design's potential. Talking about this, would you say that if we now went to wash the dishes with you, this would be an act of solidarity? Oh no, she would say that this is a collective material engagement paradigmatic of autonomy. But I'm sure she would be very keen to set up a washing assembly line as the last course of our dinner. Is that so, Julie? Mm, sounds good to me. So why don't we continue our, our assembly in the kitchen, ladies? There is a second. There's a second act. Um, let's see. Here you go. Uh, these are two friends, and they're discussing on the Architects Collective. This is a cope, which was the Greek participation in the Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2016, and we're having coffee, Caroline and I. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'm very curious to hear about your project for the Venice Biennale. How is it uh, developing? Um, kind of messy. Everyone keeps fighting about the protocol, and now there is very little time left for actual work on the content of the exhibition, which is about architecture in crisis. 
What do you mean um, as the protocol? Is there a protocol for Biennale? Well, <laughs> this is a very unusual one. We're a team of 135 architects who are co-curating the Greek pavilion together. And wh while most are in Athens, some happen to live abroad, like myself, or in other Greek cities. So many of us end up feeling sometimes excluded because we don't equally participate in the process of decision making. For instance, Skype would suddenly stop working in the middle of the session, or we can hardly hear what is said in the room, and this is becoming very frustrating. And I bet those who are in Athens uh, tend to dominate. Well, yes, most of the time. Uh, the conversations would go on despite the technical problems, and the decision would be reached by those who happen to be present in the room. Well, the usual suspects, as you can imagine. Uh, but as a result, many of the people who are not actually in Athens refuse to accept the decisions of this privileged majority. So most of the conversations focus not on whether what was decided was good or not, but on scrutinizing the process itself. And this leaves very little time to work on the content of the exhibition for the Biennale. We don't even know if we agree on some essential aspects of the project. Hmm. Ha, this, th this reminds me of the manual for the Tokyo 1964 Olympics, you know, which was supposed to, uh, to define the rules of the design, but ended up being made after the actual design. Um, but still, as you know, the designers felt that this was their most important contribution. Well, in our case, the rules were, were never put down as a document, but I would say that the general desire is to follow the rules of the assembly, like what we've seen in movements like Occupy or the Indignados, and then there is the idea that everyone will join a smaller committee, which will give opportunities for equal participation to all of us, which is, of course, yet to happen. Well, this sounds like an ancient Greek polis to me, uh, the polis. How appropriate for the Greek participation? Sure, we would have liked that, uh, but in our case, the process did not really produce a Parthenon. <laughs> <laughs> so what you described uh, reminds me of a recent paper by Christina Flesher uh, Fominaya, where she compares social movements in different countries. She finds that most activists are uh, very keen to clearly establish the guiding principles on how to hold a meeting, uh, to never speak twice, not to have uh, three people dominating, how to build a consensus, things like that, things that we should care about, I believe. <laughs> but many of them uh, criticized these uh, meetings as operating upon a sort of meta-methodology, um, a methodolatry, to use a term of our colleague Shannon Mattern. Uh, Fominaya concludes that the actions that we see in these movements are quite routinized and do not operate on a level of conscious reflection. She finds that in fact, habit and habitus play a big role. Uh, they create a set of practices that are resistant to change despite all the claims for the opposite. Mm. I very much agree with Fominaya. Uh, we see the same principles being taken very seriously by most movements today, regardless of whether they call themselves autonomous, communitarian, artist collaboratives, you name it. Uh, they all operate upon the principles of horizontality and mutual aid, but the problem for me is that often people think that the rules are not just necessary, but also sufficient to guarantee the results. In fact, many of these groups end up using a repertoire of action that can be kind of dogmatic. Uh, you know, repertoire is a term that Charles Steele used for his analysis of social movements. Uh, but I think that repertoires end up being rather unimaginative. Uh, I'm not sure if the rules of the assembly alone, for instance, are what constitutes the self-rule of autonomy. I don't know about that, but how does this process help with a design project as yours? Uh, I personally fear that we risk coming up with something that would not really go beyond the current habitus, or that would not produce an actual change, or what on what a Biennale would be like. Despite our radical idea of having 135 curators instead of just one. But wait a minute, would you wish for a change on how things will look or look like or, uh, or, or on how things are done? Mm. I guess on both. I never thought of this as a dilemma. Uh, but this brings to my mind this interesting definition of design by John Heskett. Design is to design a design to produce a design. I, I don't very much like this definition, but, I, um, but if we follow this line of thought, I would say that the emphasis on these groups is on the second use of design. Design is to design, in other words, on the process of designing. In the case of autonomous movement, uh, activists feel that the process needs to be participatory and horizontal. 
I agree that the process is important, but I worry that in order to give worthiness to this process, we should also pay attention to the third instance of design in Heskett's definition, which signifies the concept. Design is to design a design. If this is not an objective, then focusing on designing simply as a process seems rather pointless. The methodology we see in these collectives could be even dangerous. What if this participatory horizontal design ends up designing a concept that just replicates the existing unsustainable practices of the world around us, or exclusionary anti-immigration policies? This could well happen if there is no scrutiny at all on the content. At least we seem to agree that the point is not the fourth instance of design in Heskett's definition, the outcome, the Parthenon. But for me, what I think is missing with this definition is the idea of embodiment. Yes, you're right. This is the most important par part of the type of action we see in context of autonomous politics, like, for instance, in protest camps. But I'm not surprised by what you describe about your group. This sounds so typical. I don't know if you read a recent paper by John Clark. Um, his opinion is that social movements should go beyond the fetishism of the assembly. Uh, he's very critical of movements that focus too much on the program and put all their effort to, quote, uh, establish the correct set of ideas and principle, unquote. But then he talks about the feminist movement uh, where he, he sees the diligent work of nurturing relationship and fostering communities of solidarity. And in my view, this could be achieved through design if one believes in design as capability and as embodiment. I wonder whether this feminist side is what our group needs the most. I'm hoping that this might become more present in the smaller committees. It is strange that even though most of us in the group of 135 architects identified as she, we ended up missing this aspect the most. I think that you and your group might need to read some radical feminists here. <laughs> they don't talk about design, but for a good reason. Thinking of the invisible reproductive labor in domestic care, might be really useful to your group. Back to the home then? Perhaps, and on that note, I think it's time to get going. Okay, bye. Uh, thanks for the ideas. Thanks and for thank the coffee. For attending. <laughs>